everybody to this uh, book launch, Homo Mimeticus uh, book. It's a real pleasure to see you all. I see people online and uh, people in presence. We are trying to uh, continue with this hybrid mode. Then without uh, further ado, I uh, give the word to uh, Verle uh, from uh, Leuven University Press who will say a few introductory words to get us started. Thank you, Nilesh. Good afternoon and welcome to this festive book launch. Um, announcing a newly available title to the public is one of the happiest moments in a publisher's life. Though clearly it is the author who deserves all praise for successfully completing the immense intellectual task of uh, writing, composing, shaping and reshaping the content of the work. The path from proposal to final manuscript can be long, it can be winding and tough, but it also can be adventurous, fulfilling and quite enjoyable. It is only in the final stages that the publisher actively takes up his or her role and tries to be the best possible supporter on the sideline. Once the book is out, either, uh, either in, a, um, um, in a digital or in a printed format, um, it is a result of a joint effort, and this sometimes can take uh, a couple of years. But however, for Nidesh's monograph, the shared path uh, felt more like a quick and refreshing morning walk. It took us only one single year to run from proposal to published volume. In November 2021, the book proposal was submitted to our editorial board. And now one year later, here we are at the book launch. Congratulations, Niresh, for this great achievement and wonderful tour de force. Thanks to the financial support of the um, ERC and also the KU Leuven Fund for Fair Open Access, we were able to publish um, Homo Mimeticus, a theory of imitation, a new theory of imitation in gold open access. And this means that the ebook is freely available to everyone. So it can be downloaded and shared, and there are no financial barriers to get access to the content of the work. So it goes without saying that this embodies the ideal of academic publishing. The digital version of the book will find its way to a global reading audience without financial obstacles and its dissemination will go fast, which of course will maximize its visibility, its potential reach, and also its actual usage. Next to the free ebook, uh, we've also published a tangible version, of uh, the paperback edition, which is available for purchase. And uh, on the occasion of the book launch this afternoon, um, it's offered with an interesting discount. So before giving the floor um, to the author and the panel, I would like to conclude with a few words of thanks. In the first place, to the author. Thank you, Nidesh, for publishing uh, with us. It was a great pleasure to be working with you, and I hope um, that in the future we'll bring new opportunities uh, for Leuven University Press to uh, collaborate with you. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Julia, Nikki, and uh, Marina, and everyone uh, who uh, have taken or had a role in organizing uh, this afternoon. And finally, I also would like to thank uh, the audience for making time to be here. Enjoy the launch. Thank you very much, Verle, for launching this book launch, if I can allow myself the mimetic repetition. Uh, it has been a, a, a real pleasure to work with you and the entire team at Leuven University Press. But also uh, like to thank the, the ERC that supported this project for the past five years. Uh, Without that funding, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. So I'm really, really grateful. And above all, I'm, I'm grateful to, to you for coming out uh, on a Friday evening. Uh, I know that there is a tendency to, to leave uh, Leuven on Friday. So I really appreciate uh, you being here. And uh, those of you online who could join, I, I see uh, familiar and friendly phrases who have uh, contributed to the Homo Mimeticus and now the, the Gender Mimesis uh, project. And uh, above all, I would like to, to thank my team members, uh, uh, Nikki, who uh, defended the uh, PhD uh, here not long ago. So she's now here uh, not to answer questions, but to ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Marina, uh, who joined us in January, and she has been a tremendous force behind uh, the Homo Emeticus and Gender Mimesis uh, project. And uh, Julia, uh, who uh, is now in her PhD program for the Gender Mimesis Project, which is the sibling project of the Homo Mimeticus. So this is part of a 
collective effort, and I'm very honored to have you uh, on board and at this table. Um, so uh, what is the plan? Uh, we thought of trying to keep it informal uh, and to give you an impression of what this uh, book uh, on Moimeticus is, uh, is about. Uh, and so I thought that uh, uh, Nikki, Marina, and, and, and Julia will be giving short uh, five-minute presentation and then ask me some questions just to, to get a sense of, uh, of the book. And, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions uh, from the audience, uh, both online and both of you present here, um, so that we can have basic a discussion uh, uh, around the book. Uh, but uh, since it's, uh, it's about my Mises, I thought uh, to put you in, uh, in the mood uh, of the type of strange creature that uh, I'm introducing, that I, I need a mimetic medium, right? Uh, so of course, voice is a mimetic medium. Uh, so are the Zoom simulacra there. But uh, I'd like to share you uh, a brief clip of a homo mimeticus that maybe gives you, without many words, an impression of the kind of beast we have been struggling yeah. with. Fresh stories roll off the press every day about Zelig. This manifestation is neurological in order. doctors claim now, this, to have uh, the situation in hand. Suffering from, uh, no two could agree on and a I should not be surprised. I'm convinced that it's glandular in nature and all over the world. Next thing you die at this point. The future further tests will show a problem in this country. I'm certain it's something he picked up from eating Mexican food. We're just beginning to realize the dimensions of what could be the scientific medical phenomenon of the age and possibly of all time. 12 years old, I run into a synagogue. I ask the rabbi the meaning of life. He tells me the meaning of life, but he tells it to me in Hebrew. I don't understand Hebrew. Then he wants to charge me $600 for Hebrew lessons. <coughs> He was the phenomenon of the 20s. The story reflected the nature of our civilization. All the themes of our culture were there. But when you look back on it, it was, it was very strange. Ladies and gentlemen, gather around. Come one, come all to see Woody Allen's brand new documentary about the one, the only, the amazing Chameleon Man. Watch as the amazing Chameleon Man changes his form and personality to fit in with those around him. There's a brand new dance, come up the river, just jerk your head and shake your liver, don't do the Chameleon well, it is ironic to see how quickly he has faded from memory, considering what an astounding record he made. He was, of course, very amusing, uh, but at the same time touched a nerve in people, um, uh, perhaps uh, in a way which they would prefer uh, not to be touched. Uh, it certainly is a very bizarre story. The Chameleon. Woody Allen's Zelig. Coming to a theater near you. What am I suffering from? How should I know? I'm not a doctor. You're not? No, am I? The chameleon. Oh, no, no, be a wiggle like a salamander. All right, so here you have uh, an example uh, of the Homo emeticus, the, the human chameleon. An example for me to answer the question. So, you know, if uh, I have a tough question, I say, how should I know? I'm not a doctor. But uh, I, the reason I, I, uh, I show this clip, it's not only because it's a representation of uh, the Homo Mimeticus, um, but it's also because I could see it from your smile. It puts you in a certain mood, right? There is music, there is dance, there are bodies assembling. Uh, and uh, if you don't remember anything of this book launch, after we had a couple of drinks after the reception, uh, remember this, uh, the only medical is not about a representation, uh, a realistic representation of uh, reality out there. It is about that strange emotional contagion that sometimes flow from a movie, for instance, or when someone speaks or in relations uh, and introduces a change of mood and affect or a pathos, uh, as uh, we have been 
calling. Uh, and so this, this shift of attention from mimesis as representation towards a notion of embodied, affective, and deeply felt uh, imitation is what the Homo Emeticus project has been all about. Um, perhaps uh, the main goal of, uh, of the ERC project. And so without uh, further ado, uh, I now pass it on to uh, Nikki, uh, who will tell us more about, about his books. Uh, uh, I don't know what she will be saying, but the screen is yours and we'll be sharing it. So I'll be moving slightly the camera and Nikki, you can take it from here. So um, it is indeed five years um, since the Homo Mimeticus project started here in Leuven under your supervision. And uh, I remember interviewing you uh, for that occasion, for the Love and Philosophy newsletter. I don't know if you remember. Uh, and uh, I revisited that interview in preparation for today. And um, while reading, I was thinking that we have come full circle today uh, in the sense that I could uh, almost ask you the exact same questions that I was asking you then. <laughs> but now uh, with the gained knowledge and experience, of uh, five years of research on the topic of mimesis under your belt. One of the results uh, of this being indeed your latest book, Homo Mimeticus, a new theory of uh, imitation, with which I first of all want to congratulate you. Uh, it is indeed an introduction to, and I'm going to switch to Law 2 to make it a bit more official. <laughs> it is indeed an introduction to Law 2's work um, these past years on the topic of mimesis, which is, as we learn quickly, more and more complex the more we engage in it. The book sets out to have its foundations in three related perspectives, philosophy, aesthetics, and politics, which, as he argues, show a turn or return to the topic of mimesis and which are covered in the three main parts of the book. The goal is to provide a genealogy of this return to mimesis to further explore its effects and affects in today's society from a transdisciplinary perspective and in doing so to, I quote, open the field of new mimetic studies, end quote. This new direction in mimesis studies entails steering away from mimesis understood narrowly in terms of a literary or pictorial representation of the sensory world, and instead moving more towards that sensory world itself by focusing on the mimetic dimension of, I quote, free linguistic forms of bodily communication, end quote. In the first part, Lotus interlocutor is Friedrich Nietzsche, who with his, I quote, evolutionary hypothesis on the origins of language and consciousness, end quote, allows him to engage in two other important figures, writing on the inextricable link between imitation, language, and society, namely René Girard and Jacques Derrida. This link can be addressed both in a negative and hence cautious manner um, and in a positive constructive one. If imitation is something so essential to human beings, if it constitutes on the most profound levels of consciousness, body and language, how one relates to oneself and one's environment, if it is even part of human evolution to be adaptable, malleable and open to change, then one must fundamentally rethink the idea of human beings as autonomous, self-sufficient creatures and account for the, I quote, relational, embodied, and porous ego or phantom of the ego, end quote, instead. As Lotu argues, history has shown how our inclination towards affective imitation has caused us harm as well as provided us with the resistance, creativity, and necessary logic to combat its potential violence. For this double meaning of the mimetic porous self that produces its own weapons against assimilation, Lotu introduces the concept of pathologies, patho-logies, designating 
the paradoxical intertwinement of disease and cure. Marina will undoubtedly further explore, explore this point in her presentation. In the second part, Latu explores three case studies. The first dealing with the relationship between mimesis and plasticity. The second dealing with the relationship between animal and human mimicry. And the third dealing with the phenomenon of the human chameleon in the figure of Woody Allen's Selig, of which we saw a fragment uh, earlier. A red thread throughout these case studies is thinking mimesis through the actor and hence necessarily through the lens of theatricality. Since ancient times, mimesis has had its theatrical function in society, whether it be on an individual level in the formation of and experimentation with self-presentation or on a community level in the construction of games, role plays, and dramatic representations in which it can participate and against which it can mirror itself. Surprising here is that Latou does not understand the theater as a subcategory of aesthetics, but instead the art par excellence to study the aesthetic, precisely because of the theater's proximity to the seductions and deceptions inherent in mimesis understood as mimicry or mimetism. In the third part, the fictitious, imaginary, or phantomic, to stay in Lotus terminology, powers of imitation are examined in the context of politics. Lotu translates Alan's character of Tselik with its infinite transformations to the behavior of political leaders, more precisely fascist leaders, and exposes yet another typically paradoxical mimetic disease, the deployment of mimicry and self-transformation at the surface of a political ideal of uniformity. Lotu discusses communal and social uniformity also from another angle, namely that of affective contagion. So taking his cues from the so-called founding fathers of crowd psychology, Gustave Lebon and Gabriel Tav, among others. It is yet again a theatrical notion that Latou foregrounds, namely the power of suggestion. I quote, both Lebon and Tart, in fact, like Nietzsche before them, relied on the model of hypnosis or hypnotic suggestion to account for the contagi contagious dynamic of emotions, end quote. For this phenomenon, Latou uses the concept of mimetic unconscious, which he stresses, traces back to a pre-Freudian tradition, further analyzed in the work of Roger Caillois, Georges Bataille, and Pierre Janet. So in light of all this, where does Lotu leave the reader? In his dialogue with philosopher and sociologist Edgar Morin, which closes the book, Lotu asks about the contribution of art, or the novel more particularly, in the affective lives of human beings, and Morin answers as follows, I quote, at bottom, what interests me is that these capacities, that is mimetic capacities that are both voluntary and involuntary, require a certain subjective state of trance, which can be frenetic or soft. These secondary um, particular poetic states are very important for us because they are very present in our lives and we often do not realize it. Mimesis manifests itself in a state of trance, more or less soft, more or less strong. There are no precise words for these trances. They could be cases of what is called possession or of hysteria or of, si or of similar terms. These states, which are very frequent in our lives, should interest us more. We ignore them too much, end quote. So with that, I'm kind of rounding up my part of the presentation and moving on to my first question, which is very general question, uh, how you would situate the book in the context of the ERC project, which indeed uh, turned out to be almost five years. And, um, yeah, what have you discovered and what aspects are you most pleased with, uh, I suppose? 
Thanks very much, uh, Nikki, for, for giving a, a well-rounded uh, account of a, a strange protein book, right? That uh, has uh, different facets of a transforming uh, metamorphic uh, concept. Um, so indeed, uh, the question about how it fits into, into the ERC project is, is a fundamental question because, because this book is in a way the culmination of these five years thinking about my thesis. And actually, before I applied to the ERC grant, there were like kind of 15 years probably thinking about, obsessing about these topics. So there was a run-up uh, before the ERC grant. And, and uh, I think it's important to, to indeed uh, take a moment and, and look back, at least for me, I have been doing it over the past weeks because the project came to an end. And I realized that, you know, it, it's important uh, when, when a project begins, and I still remember it five years ago, it wasn't that long ago, we had a presentation of the project. What you have when you start an ERC grant is basically an hypothesis, hopefully a well-crafted hypothesis, was tested. Uh, and then you have a list of promises. You have a list of promises of things that you attempt or you will attempt to do with a team that you don't know yet, you know, still in the process of making. And you have a million. And, uh, and a million, of course, may, makes all the difference. Uh, so it's normal there is a tension uh, when an ERC comes in. Uh, but I was also thinking it's kind of important as well at the end. The million is gone, squandered, disappeared, uh, invested. But, uh, you know, from the point of view of research, okay, so were these promises kept or not? These kind of ideas that were hypothesis. And, and so it, it is an important I think a uh, moment to look back and, and looking back, I can say, well, the, the Omaha Medicals project didn't keep the promises. It didn't keep them a la lettre. Uh, it delivered much more than, than it promised. So uh, maybe I can just give you a, a brief overview of what I'm happy about, because uh, indeed this book is part of something bigger. And the first is what you see lined up here. The fact that you have three women philosophers speaking on a panel in a, in a world in which philosophy is still, I'm sorry to say, a very much patriarchal world, uh, I think for me, intellectually, uh, already justified the effort in applying for the grant. So that was already something that having you on board uh, and uh, the additional team members that we had already justified. It, uh, it was a collective effort and so uh, most happy about the way that we managed to collaborate together on on this project. Then of course, you also have to deliver something. And so it can only, and uh, an ERC project should in principle operate a paradigm shift around a given problem or concept. And I always thought paradigm shift, I remember reading Kuhn early on, and it's not something that happens overnight, paradigm shift, right? Uh, and so I said, I always spoke of a shift of emphasis. Let's try to shift the emphasis from a dominant notion of mimesis understood as a realistic representation of the fame towards something more different, more protean and dynamic, uh, a shift of emphasis. And so the first thing did is to reach out to helpers. If a shift there, there is to be, then it cannot happen individually, heroically in isolation. And so I'm very happy to look back and see that we organized a number of workshops with figures in philosophy like Jean-Luc Nancy, who spoke in this room, or Jean-Michel Rabaté from literary theory, or Bill Connolly from political theory also spoke in this room, Christoph Wolff, Gunther Gebauer, Catherine Hills, and Adriana Cavariero, and, and many others that joined forces with uh, the Homo Emeticus project and, and they responded uh, at a time in which it was also difficult because we were hit by a pandemic and they said, yes, I'm gonna either travel or contribute online. So for me, that uh, uh, was uh, very meaningful and very honored that it worked collectively, all these workshops and, and conferences. Um, and then in terms of, of results, uh, the, the ERC has this, uh, Kind of database where all the work was basically available. And uh, looking back, I had a look at the B1 and, and, and the B2, which is what you need to submit to apply for an ERC grant. And, and I had promised uh, two books, uh, two special issues, and 10 articles. And it seemed to me ambitious. And I think it was. And collectively, we managed uh, to uh, deliver, says here, eight books. It's actually four books and four special issues. So. Over 30 articles, peer-reviewed uh, book chapters, uh, 
And so it's it's more than the double. And, and this has been a collective effort. So uh, for me, looking back, I say, yeah, uh, good. Uh, we did our job and we did it well. Here you see some of the outputs. But what what, what interested me was, was never the quantity, right? What does it mean? You know, like 10 articles, 20 articles. It doesn't mean much. We are in a quantitative world where, the, where what matters is, is the number. But I had promised that the challenge of the ERC project that I had submitted was that I promised something across disciplines in philosophy, but also nature studies, and uh, with forays in, in political theory. And, and that was to me the main challenge because when we say interdisciplinarity, it's one thing to say it, but then you, you send it out to peer reviewed journals and you got specialists in, in fields uh, who are going to evaluate it, not from the perspective of interdisciplinarity, but from a discipline based perspective. And so what matters to me is not, it's not the number, but it's the fact that we managed to have publications in philosophy and peer reviewed journals in philo philosophy and have a strong philosophical team for that, but also in literary studies, building on work on Conrad that I had done, but also in film and media studies, and then also in political theory political research quarterly and these are journals in, in, in political theory. And I, I didn't hire a political theorist or I didn't hire a film scholar. I hired people who were interested in the problem, my missus. And then we work with that. So I think looking back, that is one of the things that I'm that I'm proud of because cutting across the disciplines with the journal, that's where you see whether it's an idea or it's, or it's a practice. And I must say, that was the most challenging thing that I think we, we attempted a, as a team. I'm so happy about that. How was it possible? Well, because we had strong precursors. And the Homo Emeticus relied on a strong genealogy of precursors uh, whose books we have studied in the Homo Emeticus seminar, then supplemented by the Gender Mimesis project as well. Uh, you see a book by Sam Essling, we uh, read early on, but also uh, figures like Philippe Coulabart, Derrida, Eli Garay, and others. And so we thought that if we want to shift the emphasis of understanding of Mimesis, we have to step back to these figures and think with them, not repeat what they said, but kind of try to push it in, uh, in new directions on, on their shoulders. And, and looking back, yes, uh, as the last point that I want to make is uh, that uh, I, I wrote this, this short book on new fascism a, a while ago, and it was at the moment in which using the term fascism seemed a little bit daring. Uh, 2016, I started thinking about it. The book came out in 2019, I think. It took a bit more time than this one. And then we've seen January 6th, storming of the Capitol, then it was no longer controversial. So I also kind of risking, there is an element of risk which an ERC grant allows you to take. I wish I'd been wrong, but unfortunately we see that uh, the return of the far right and, and now the war, that there is political concern on that front. This book, the ambition is to develop a, a new field uh, titled mimetic studies, and we might come back to that uh, in a moment. And then I also take the occasion to, to announce uh, two uh, forthcoming books uh, on the relationship between uh, violence and, and the unconscious, looking at the ancient idea of catharsis and, uh, and contagion. And uh, they will be out next year. And uh, if you wonder about the, the strikingly beautiful covers that you have lined up, I have Escher for the Homo Mimeticos book, but uh, I'm lucky to be married to, to an artist who has been hearing about my obsession about my Mises for, for the past 20 years. And so when I ask her about an impression of what I mean with uh, catharsis hypothesis or the contagious hypothesis, she came up with, with those figures and, and works of art. So that's uh, some of the things I'm happy about. And again, it's a, it's a collective. It's a collective. Mm -hmm. Thanks for giving me the occasion to, to give a little summary. Still time to ask another question. Yeah, I can, yeah. I can give a brief around. Yeah, yeah. The philosopher and literary critic Philippe Lacoulabart uh, features 162 times in your book and uh, well throughout the chapters. What makes him and perhaps also his uh, close collaborator, Jean-Luc Nancy, such an important figure uh, for the new theory of imitation you set out? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks for asking about that. Philippe Lacoulabart, you see one of his books, hmm. Uh, that was very important for me and the Homo Medical Project and for your dissertation because I think it figures more in your PhD. 
<laughs> it's in the title. It's in the title. That's so. true. <laughs> but uh, but it does figure a lot in uh, in the Omi Medical book, and it's actually the first title that uh, I mentioned is Limitation de Moderne in, in the introduction. And there are a couple of reasons. I think the Libre Coulabar deserves attention, um, maybe because he's the lesser known of uh, the trio of, as Derrida called himself, the three musketeers of deconstruction, uh, Derrida, Jaluc Nancy, and, uh, and Philippe Lacoulabart. The less well known, but it's the one who devoted his career thinking and rethinking my Mises. There is this phrase in Limitation de Moderne where it says, Obligation aux effets de penser et repenser la, la mimesis. And, and that phrase kind of stuck with me. And uh, so I have a chapter on La Coulabart, it's probably where many of the references appear, but he appears throughout. And uh, one of the reasons that I think he, he is important is because he identifies an important paradox that was also at the center of, uh, of your PhD, uh, Nikki, and the paradox of the fact that mimesis has, has improper qualities that can lead to a passive form of imitation, uh, as in fascism, for instance, uh, fascist crowds, that's a passive mimesis. But then he was interested in, in what he calls a general mimesis. Uh, and he makes this distinction between restricted and general mimesis. And I'd read a lot of Bataille before reading La Coulabart and Bataille uh, as a notion of general economy uh, that uh, kind of gives it a, a vitalist spin uh, to his thought. And I think La Coulabart was thinking uh, of Bataille via Derrida as well. And so his question was how to turn a passive mimesis into a productive one. Uh, not simply a reproductive, but productive, affirmative one. And that is a question that I try to rework myself in the Homo Emeticus book uh, from the angle of what I call pathologies that you mentioned. How a, a sickness, a pathological form of imitation can turn in something, into something affirmative uh, and productive. Uh, also a logos on the pathos. But we might talk more about, about that uh, later on. But that, that's the reason I think uh, La Coulabart uh, is a key figure or a precursor of what we started calling the, the mimetic term. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now it is my turn to say a few words, and I will focus on the Nietzschean inspiration of this new important milestone for new mimetic studies. Nides Lotus's new book is a contribution of significant interest to Nietzsche scholars because it uncovers an effective, relational, and embodied account of mimesis in Nietzsche's philosophy. It is also of interest, as is evident, to anyone interested in the problem of mimesis, independently of their discipline or background, and they will, in addition, enjoy a rigorous and accessible analysis of Nietzsche's thought. Homometicus, a new theory of imitation, ratifies Nietzsche as a thinker of mimesis and as a major inspiration for new mimetic studies, for the mimetic turn or return. One of the book's key insights is that Nietzsche anticipated a mimetic hypothesis in the origins of language, consciousness, communication, and culture for more than a century, supporting the idea that imitation plays a crucial role in our social engagement with other beings, be they human or non-human. We are imitative creatures and coming to being through mimesis in our collective history as a species and also in our personal formation as individuals. Nietzsche's mimetic hypothesis shows that the human condition is not original, but very much produced and reproductive. It has received empirical confirmation in scientific findings such as brain plasticity, mirror neurons, and even epigenetics. Hence, it provides reliable genealogical foundations for new mimetic studies and avoids speculative hypotheses such as René Girard's founding sacrificial murder. I believe one of the key and more intriguing insights worth stressing in this book launch is that mimesis works beyond good and evil, which is, as is well known, the title of one of Nietzsche's most important books. This is indeed one of the main theses of the mimetic return, which is both an opportunity and a risk, a true challenge. 
the ego is plastic for better and worse. An essential virtue of Lotus' new theory of imitation is that it sketches a diagnostic of good and bad forms of mimesis. It accounts for positive forms of mimesis, such as sympathy, community, the power of positive models and examples, cooperation, joyful inclination, and many others. But it also critically accounts for negative, irrational, and destructive forms of mimesis, such as mimicry, resentment, violent rivalries, scapegoating, new fascism, fascism, the topic of one of Lotus' previous books, and related social pathologies that push people to seek refuge in what Nietzsche called the shadows of God, that is phantom-like afterwards. Nietzsche urges us to stay true to the earth, and so does Lotus' new theory of imitation with its immanent material foundation that aspire to renew our faithfulness to the earth here and now, a call that acquires new meaning in the age of the Anthropocene. Thus, this new theory of imitation paves the way for a new type of discernment, a genealogical diagnostic that can differentiate between positive aspects or outcomes of my mimesis and other possible adverse effects, effects or pathologies. Reading the book, it becomes clear that one of Lotus' main goals and concerns is to foreground this Nietzschean genealogy of for new mimetic studies instead of Girard's mimetic theory. For this reason, instead of mimetic desire, Lotus coins other concepts on the shoulders of Nietzsche, for example, reformulating the will to power as mimetic pathos. To conclude, I will read some paragraphs from page 66 that I find particularly enlightening. The mimetic return must be expanded to consider a post-human receptivity to the more generalized concept of mimetic pathos that includes all affects, good and bad, individual and collective, sad and joyous, pathological and pathological. It is only on such a dynamic, perspectival and transdisciplinary base that we can keep up with the transformations of our species in the present and future. On the side of genealogical practices, Nietzsche offers an alternative foundation for the mimetic return. He puts us in a position to see that at the origins of consciousness, language, and by extension, culture, is not a cry for murder against a sacrificial victim, but a cry for help not to be a victim. So, Nidesh, could you please tell us a bit more about the advantages of starting with Nietzsche's genealogy of mimetic communication instead of René Girard's sacrificial hypothesis? Thank you, Marina. Uh, thank you uh, very much for, for looking at the Homemeticos book from the angle of Nietzsche, uh, who, uh, along with Lacula Bast, um, is so arguably the, the main driving force behind this book. It starts with uh, a chapter on Nietzsche, as, uh, as you pointed out. Um, and indeed, uh, the stakes uh, for me in this book uh, was to, to confront some previous theories of imitation that already paid attention to uh, Homo Mimeticus. To the fact that mimesis is an anthropological function. And, and René Girard is a, is a major uh, figure uh, for that. Uh, it was a little bit eclipsed in, uh, in the 80s, uh, where everybody was enthralled by, by deconstruction. But there is a return of attention to, to, to Girard, uh, because the theory of the scapegoat uh, and the violence that ensues is, is kind of visible. And, and I think it works. For me, when I read Girard, I had read Nietzsche before reading Girard, and I could recognize certain continuities to Nietzsche and Girard, but I also saw that uh, in uh, his own reading of Nietzsche, Girard did uh, hermeneutic violence to the Nietzschean text. And so in, uh, in my first book, The Phantom of the Ego, uh, I tried to show that the, the Nietzschean account of my Mises doesn't fit within uh, uh, the triangular schema in which mimetic desire leads to rivalry and uh, uh, scapegoating mechanisms in order to 
put an end to, to violence. Yes, that, that is one function, but, but Nietzsche has a richer theory of imitation. And I think you did an excellent job in pointing out the reasons already mm -hmm. for kind of facilitating, and I'll keep it short and, you know, but indeed uh, for, for Nietzsche, my, my myth is, is not inherently bad. It's not necessarily a path for violence. Uh, uh, and the reason uh, for Nietzsche, it goes beyond good and evil um, because it doesn't have a theory of mimetic desire. It doesn't start with desire. And Girard's theory of desire, I think, should be contextualized in the 60s, where uh, desire was considered the main entry into subjectivity. There was a lot of attention uh, to desire because of psychoanalysis. Lacan was in the air. But, but so there was an attention to Hegel's uh, master and slave dialectics. Um, it's a question of recognition of desire of the other. And so Girard theory, mimetic theory, it's a theory that emerges in the 60s. And, and I argue that it's still very much a, a Freudian theory. Yeah. There is a triangle, there is an ambivalent relationship with a model, and violence ensues. If violence is there are the origins of culture. So if you read Totem and Taboo and Violence in the Sacred, you, you will see the, the continuities. And, and one of the advantages in starting with Nietzsche was that Nietzsche is a pre-Freudian thinker. And it comes before Freud. And he has a different theory of culture. He has an affirmative theory of culture where he recognizes nihilism and violence, past passions, if you want to use that term, as Spinoza term. But he also wants to promote a life affirmative theory in order to face nihilism. And it seemed to me that that was one of the reasons, uh, there are many others, but one of the reasons that it seems to me in a moment in which the Girardian theory accounts for a lot of violent phenomena that we see here, that it's important to, to look at the other side, uh, the affirmative mimesis, and not try to capture it in a Freudian or triangular schema, but, but follow its becoming, if you want. That would be something that uh, I try to think uh, with, with Nietzsche. Uh, there are many other reasons, but those two, I think, are the main. Thank you. And is your Nietzsche an inspiration another reason behind your call to launch new mimetic studies instead of mimetic theory? Right. So, yes, uh, mimetic studies. I, I mentioned it before. Uh, uh, and that is basically due to the fact that every time that I talked about homo mimeticus, uh, a term view of mimicry that is rooted in subjectivity, the term mimetic theory came up. And, and that automatically refers to Girard's mimetic theory. And, and I always thought, well, there is more than one theory of my myth. There is a plurality of theories. You mentioned Le Coulabart, uh, that's deconstructive, Girard, mimetic theory, but I will talk about Arendt uh, in the book. She doesn't have a mimetic theory, but she helps us think about uh, my myth is Cavarero. So it's a plural concept. And so I thought that mimetic studies would be a way of opening it up and it links to the pathologies where the emphasis there too is on, on a plurality of logo eh, that uh, we can tap into in order to account for, for mimetic uh, pathos or the logic of this mimetic affect that is, uh, that is contagious. And so the, the idea of mimetic studies is to open it up and it's an invitation really that we started also with the general mimesis and the metamorphosis seminar, um, people to join and contribute new perspectives to account for the becomings of homo mimeticos in the 21st century. And there's, there are many, so there's plenty of space. Thank you, yes, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Julia and I'm a PhD student within the Gender Mimesis Project held by Professor Lotu and based at the Institute of Philosophy. I am interested in mentioning the Gender Mimesis project again, because at first glance, it could read as a bit in contrast to the definition of homo mimeticus, as if there were two domains, one concerning mimetic subjects in general, and um, one on the gendered subjects. Knowing this is not at all the case, I would like to restart with the title of your book, Homo mimeticus. It is indeed a title that considers the possibility of discussing human beings and providing a specific theory about them through mimesis. On the one hand, your book aspires to this goal, not giving up the philosophical exploration of the concept of the human. At the same time, however, it is clear reading it that this ambition does not translate into developing a universal transhistorical conception of the human being per se, nor of the homo mimeticus. 
as you say at the beginning of the book, the shadow of patriarchy is, uh, with its colonial and racial dimension, is still very much in evidence, not only in the academic sphere of which your study is a part, but in every contemporary social political practice. You mention how the civil rights movements and feminist post-colonial and decolonial theories have left an indelible trace, though still too often overlooked, on the Western philosophical canon. In this way, your genealogical approach seeks to retrace alternative canons for the notion of mimesis. For example, in confronting Plato, you decided to use a different lens to the androcentric tradition that normally investigates his work. In the chapter Vitaminatica in the Cave, you consider the reading of Plato by Italian philosopher Adriana Cavarero, who in the 1980s was among the first classicists in Europe to reread the Platonic thought with a feminist lens. That your book chose to look at the ancient traces of mimesis through Cavarero's work seemed to me to avoid the risk of an oppressive methodology for one that creates different genealogies to rethink ancient concepts. And this methodology, of course, affects the peculiarity of the concept themselves. Through your dialogue with Cavarero, in your book, mimesis becomes a dynamic not of self-centered, disembodied and vertical subjects typical of a Western tradition, but of a subject who is first and foremost vulnerable, always inclined towards the others, that is embodied in a relational and always political space. And only in this frame, the subject appears as mimetic. You and Cavarero had the chance to work together and coined the expression mimetic inclination to describe this kind of subjectivities, which seems central to the vita mimetica that your book proposes. So, considering the commitment of your book to avoid an abstract definition of the human and the concept of mimesis itself, and even more its commitment to show how mimesis actually enables a critique of this abstraction, why then retain the concept of homo mimeticus in the first place? Right, it's a good <laughs> deconstructive question, and it's uh, uh, one that I indeed I address in, uh, in the introduction, uh, right? Why, why should we retain this ancient notion of homo uh, when, when the goal is to decenter uh, and deterritorialize uh, and introduce, inject difference uh, into, into the human? Um, I think the short answer would be because uh, well, the Homo Emeticus is there uh, as, a, as an alternative or a supplement, let's say, to, to the traditional notion of Homo sapiens, sapiens, um, like all those that are true sapiens. Uh, and, um, and there have been others, right? Uh, homo economicus, Homo ludens, uh, Homo faber. And, uh, and it seems to me, Homo deus, uh, more recently, uh, it seems to me that uh, the mimeticus in the homo uh, destabilizes, troubles, uh, uh, undermines the, the idea that we have behind homo sapiens. So this is the one that Nikki mentioned, the one of an autonomous, fully rational, fully present, fully conscious uh, subject uh, who is divided from others, so is uh, impermeable to emotions, so sovereign in, in a way. So the mimeticus uh, is there to, to trouble uh, the homo, but I also think that we have to think genealogically. And so, yes, we are still members of the species Homo sapiens. And so rather than raising the term homo, I thought to use it very much like Adriana Cavarero, using the terms uh, like the notion of maternity and the stereotypes that go along with it in order to, to bring them as. So I would say that's part of the deterritorializing deconstructive operation to bring uh, my mimesis in order to inject differences uh, into, for instance, a platonic uh, the theory of, of the cave that has been read and reread. But indeed, if you reread the text in the company of somebody like Adriana Cavarero, you, you will feel it differently. I called it vita mimetica, because the vita mimetica is somewhere in between the vita contemplativa, outside of the cave, uh, the embodied, looking up in the sky, and the vita activa, which is uh, the act concept that Arendt coined, that Arendt wasn't much interested in emotions, wasn't much, much interested in the affective dynamic down in the cave. And so I think the vita mimetica operates uh, uh, as an in-between uh, the two, the vita uh, activa and the vita contemplativa. So that would be one way of beginning to answer your important question. Okay, then I'll go to the second aspect that um, I think your book sheds light on, which is, it is that of considering mimesis always as part of the formation of an embodied subject. 
giving back space to materiality, more usually divested in favor of philosophical analysis on language or the discursive aspects of subject formation. Your conception of mimesis is indeed closer to the idea of contagion rather than representation. It is a mimetic contact between relational subjects that condition each other first and foremost from an affective and pre-discursive basis. A chapter of the book touches closely on a crucial concept for rethinking mimesis in material terms, which is that of plasticity. Here you are in dialogue with contemporary philosopher Catherine Malabou and her analysis around the concept of plasticity, which takes its cue from neuroscientific studies, molecular biology, and most recent theories of evolution. It seems to me an important dialogue that prevents philosophy from remaining in simple antagonism to the sciences, neglecting the possibility of a productive exchange on shared problems. The conflict you touch here is not only trying to confront classical binomials of Western philosophy, such as body, mind, mind, nature, and culture, but also the conflict between philosophical methodologies, such as that between deconstruction and the more recent theories of the new materialisms. You write at the end of the chapter that the genealogical method and the plasticity of mimesis, quote, I quote, opens up a space for innovative dialogues between the humanities and the neurosciences, along lines that are neither reductionists nor confined to cognitive methods. And Malabu's work testifies to the productivity of this connection. Her thought is in line with exploratory transdisciplinary perspectivism at play in Homo mimeticus, and helps us go beyond dualisms that were dominant in the past yet need to be challenged in the present and future." End quote. Could you then tell us uh, more of how your account of mimesis allows for the investigation of an embodied and plastic subject formation avoiding sterile binarisms? Right. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Giulio. It's a, it's a question that anticipates a conference that we're organizing, right? We're organizing a conference with Catherine Malabou in February. She will be your keynote. So you can keep that question for her as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and indeed it, it's based on that uh, the chapter on the plasticity of mimesis where I bring Philippe Lacoulabart's reading of Plato in dialogue uh, with Catherine Malabou recent notion of, of plasticity uh, that comes with an engagement with neuroplasticity. And, um, Yes, it opens up the dialogue between these two cultures, right? That we've been accustomed to thinking with and against uh, humanities and the hard sciences. And uh, I was thinking while you, you were speaking about the sciences, like I had a scientific start. Started uh, with a scientific gymnasium. And it's four years of science with eight hours of math. And after those four years, my only interest was to get out of it. <laughs> and they went to the humanities. So it's not that I disregard the differences, the methodological differences between the two. I have friends who remained, my you know, childhood friends went to the Teha in Zurich and they're physicists and, and chemists and so forth. So I see that there is a different methodology behind. At the same time, when one focuses on a problem, like in this case, the problem of, of mimesis, it seems to me there is only to be gained, you know, to to add to the plurality of logoi, whatever science uh, discourse uh, is addressing a particular manifestation of your problem. And, and with the case of plasticity, it seemed to me that uh, uh, indeed, especially in the way uh, Catherine Malabou defines it, as this kind of ability to receive form and give form, there is a paradox there of you know, passive receptivity to form and active giving form, which is very much similar to the paradox that I mentioned with uh, Nikki before about mimesis in La Coulabart being both passive and uh, productive, um, both receiving a form, being impressed, and being able to create a new configuration. And so, once again, if you follow the problem, then uh, the, the genealogical connections might allow you to establish bridges. Now, Catherine Malabou is a philosopher, and she reads uh, neuroscientists, like Jean-Pierre Changeux, for instance. And so I went and read uh, neuroscientists this account of, of brain plasticity. And it seems to me just an occasion for the humanities to enter into a dialogue in which uh, the scientists are already participating and offering view on, or their views on aesthetics or on politics. Very often I find that 
popularizing account of established sciences are very well written from a certain former point of view. And so they, they are able to simplify science that is quite technical. And it seems to me that we shouldn't be defensive, uh, but we, we should welcome the challenge and encourage the dialogue. And of course, acknowledge also the differences between the two. And, and my starting point, as Marina pointed out, is a, is a materialist uh, imminent theory of imitation that starts with Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche was very interested in the science of his time. Uh, he considered enrolling in medicine at a certain point. Uh, very interested in Freud, obviously very interested in the science of his time. And so even philologically, when we read these authors who are obviously in the humanities, if you read them carefully, what they're reading, then we are also led to transgress these two cultures uh, distinction. So I would say that's a starting point. And then I let Catherine Malabou <laughs> follow up. Thank uh, thanks so much. These were kind of wonderful, very intense uh, <laughs> uh, questions. Uh, and uh, you obviously know the problematic inside out. So I'm very proud that I managed yeah. to kind of stimulate your interest uh, in, in that direction. So. Thanks, then I would say uh, I have something uh, short uh, to end the event. Uh, it's a short video. It's just an aperfu, a little impression of uh, some helpers that we've had over the past uh, five years that I thought I wanted them to be, to be present as well. Disons quelques mots en ces temps de fin du monde. <rire> voilà. On enregistre les dernières images d'un monde qui n'existera bientôt plus. Alors, ça va ou pas Ou c'est la fin We are hosting a workshop with Jean-Luc Nancy. La philosophie s'intéresse à la mimesis parce que elle demande une bonne mimesis plutôt mimesis savante que la mimesis qui sait ce qu'elle fait en, en imitant. French uh, place names around here from early French explorers. If you're coming in from the ocean by ship, the first thing you really see as you came your way in from out in the ocean would be the top of uh, Isle Ho. <laughs> the local pronunciation is through. Some people say Isle Hut. <laughs> All these names like Detroit. You know, it's de toi. Pour moi, le, le côté mimétique, je, je crois que je l'ai senti en, en moi. Et ça, je l'ai dit dans mon livre sur l'esthétique. Quand j'étais jeune et surtout étudiant, là, alors je faisais des croquis, des, des caricatures des personnes qui m'étaient proches, que je voyais, camarades, amis. Bon. Et alors, j'ai été frappé de, de pouvoir trouver la ressemblance, et sans regarder la personne. Et chaque fois que je voulais faire un, un dessin en regardant la personne, en voulant faire le front, le nez, enfin, analytiquement, ce n'était pas ressemblant. Mais ce que nous n'avons pas vu, c'est comment essentiel ritual est fait, en spite des points. Where you have to be careful and which you have, might have to, to criticize. 
they are still so constitutive. And it is, uh, so we worked on this and, you know, with this 12 year study could show how central they are in education and family, media, peer group, and could show that this, they are essential and you cannot imagine a society without rituals. The cultural learning is to a large extent mimetic. delle tematiche fondamentali per Platone è quella della mimesis, eh, concetto verso il quale Platone ha un atteggiamento critico e negativo, perché quello che poi tu chiami l'homo mimeticus è un uomo che Platone rifugge. Uh, well, I'm a political theorist and who teaches at Johns Hopkins University. I grew up in a working class family in Flint, Michigan, and my work for a while now has been focusing on the impact of planetary processes on capitalism, and I've been interested in the dangers of what I'm calling aspirational fascism. C'est un peu, c'est un peu fauteuil de metteur en scène. Tu peux écrire derrière. Le chapeau de chasse. C'est le chapeau qui manque. Ah oui, ça je peux vous en passer.